I'm not a kid. You're not a kid anymore. I want to be a teenager in my life. I mean, that doesn't make you a man, though. Right? We'll talk about that, though. Yeah, yeah, my my little helper right here. Yeah, <laughs> um, man, I, I I'm excited to get back into uh, Colossians chapter three. I, I I certainly I certainly pray that that after the curveball I, I, we were thrown here in the last twenty minutes that uh, my my mind can can get back uh, focused to, to to the Word of God. But uh, man, Colossians, Colossians chapter three is really one of my, uh, chapter two and three specifically are, are two of my favorite chapters in the New Testament, uh, uh, more specifically two of my favorite chapters that, that are, are written uh, in, in Paul's epistles specifically. So much good teaching uh, to be had in here, so much good doctrine to be had in here, uh, 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 some, some wonderful encouragement, some admonishment uh, as well. But, uh, you know, after uh, last week's hiatus, you know, I, I felt the need last week, of course, to, to sort of speak to the issues that were at hand uh, after the situation that happened uh, the day prior uh, with President Trump and the attempted assassination on him and, and just thought that it was important to, to preach that message, uh, a divided a nation and, 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 and share that with you guys and, and with whomever else would, would, would hear that. But uh, uh, excited to get back into Colossians. Uh, chapter 3, as we continue our series this morning, uh, the head of the body, of course, speaking specifically of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, get going. I'll, I'll, I'll read the first uh, uh, two verses, and then uh, uh, we're going to unpack the rest of the, the chapter, Lord willing, this morning, uh, and, and, and get rocking and rolling. Paul says this, he says, if ye then be risen with Christ, he says, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. In verse number two, he says this, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Church family, pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I, I would ask right now, Father God, that you would uh, just calm my nerves, Lord God, and, and, and whatever worry and anxiousness I have going on uh, with my mom and with my wife, Lord, would you allow me at least for the time that lays ahead, uh, Father, where your word is open before me and before this church family, Lord, would you allow my heart and my mind to be focused on you, uh, focused on this message, Lord God, that I have studied and reviewed that you have given me over the last few days, Lord. And Father, I pray that you would just move me aside and, and take over. Have your way with me. Allow your Holy Spirit to be my voice, Lord, to be my thoughts, my mind, my eyes, my ears. Lord God, I, I, I surrender it all and give it all to you this morning. Father, I pray for this church family this morning. Oh, Lord, as this message is preached, that their hearts and minds would receive exactly and specifically, Lord God, what it is that they need to receive from this message, Lord. And Father God, I pray that you would be glorified and honored in it and through it. I ask this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Paul says, if you be then risen with Christ, which we are. Remember, Paul talked about uh, 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 in chapter number two that we were buried with him in baptism. Right? But then that we were uh, made alive. He hath quickened us together with him. Right, and so if, if he, Paul says, if you then be risen with Christ, which you are, he says, seek those things which are above. Well, where's he talking? Seek those things in the sky, seek the stars and the sun and the moon. No, he says, where in verse number one, Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Paul is saying, seek those things that are in and of the kingdom of God. Seek those things that are in the heavens right, where the Lord's dwelling place is. Seek those things that are above, that, that, that are with him. I, I, I think of righteousness. Seek after righteousness. Seek after godliness. Seek after holiness. Seek after those things, not only for the edification of yourself and for others around you, but more specifically for the glory, for the honor, for the praise, and for the worship of the Lord. Paul says to seek those things which are above. In verse number two, he says, set your affection, your mind, 
your desires on things above, not on things on the earth. We as Christians often tend to get our minds and our desires and our affections intertwined, intermingled with the things on earth and the things that are above. Paul says, set your affection on things above. He doesn't say to commingle it with things on earth. As a matter of fact, he says very specifically and not on things on the earth. In other words, don't set your desires on the things that are on this earth. Why? Because this earth is fleeting. We are but on, on, on a blip of a radar in our existence here on earth. In the, some 6,000 plus years that earth has existed, we are but a microism of time that we're here on earth. And then we enter into eternity. And yet we become, become consumed with the desires and with the affections of this earth. And, and, and Paul's certainly not saying, listen, to, to, to not enjoy what God has blessed you with. As a matter of fact, if you go back and read the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, enjoy it. Enjoy the fruit of your labor. King Solomon says all throughout Ecclesiastes, enjoy the fruit of your labor. If you're able to have a, a, a nice house and, and have a car in the driveway or, or even more, have a, have a boat on the lake or, or have these other great, wonderful things and, and a great job, enjoy them, but don't let them occupy and fulfill your mind. Don't, don't become consumed by them. Because what happens when you become consumed by them is that it takes away from our relationship with the Lord. If we're not consumed of the things that are above, if our affections are not set on those things that are above, then they are set somewhere else. They're usually set on things here on earth. And Paul's going to expand on this in a moment. He says, for you are dead in verse 3 and your life is hid with Christ in God. We've died to our old selves. The old ways. The old things. Again, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, old things have passed away. Paul says you are dead, and your life, our new life, is hid with Christ in God. That's why he says to set your affections on those things which are above and not on things on earth. Why? Because our life is hid with Christ. And if our life is hid with Christ, we cannot have any part of our affections being found or sought after in the things of the world. They must solely be given to Christ. Our mind must solely be given to the Lord Jesus Christ and nowhere else and nothing else. Why? Because we are dead to this world. And our life, again, is hid in Christ Jesus. He says in verse number four, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. What is Paul talking about right here? Paul is talking about when Christ comes down, the second coming, when Christ comes down and reveals himself in all his glory, in all his lordship, as the son of the living God, Paul says when Christ comes down and shall appear to all, he goes to the church, you also will appear with him in glory. That right there, folks, is the hope that you and I have today in this world, in these mortal bodies, in all the evil and wickedness and chaos and destruction that goes on around us continuously, is that when Christ appears in his glory, when the light of the world, Jesus Christ, comes down and he reveals himself to this world, we will stand with him revealed in the same glory, revealed in the same light, because again, as we just read, our life is hid in Christ 
with God. And he says in verse 5, because of this, he says mortify. In other words, put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Again, you've got to die to yourself. You've got to put them to death. Any selfish desire, any, any, uh, any covetousness that I have, any lust that I have. Paul says, put to death your members which are upon the earth. And he gives some examples, fornication, sexual immorality, uncleanness, inordinate affection. I, I, I love that inordinate uh, affection. Uh, um, unclean passions, ungodly desires, in other words. He says, put away evil concupiscence. Another silly King James words, but put away evil desires. And evil desires, anything that you desire lust after that is not godly, that is not holy, that is not righteous, that is not pure. Paul says to put to death these things. He says to put to death covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness is when you lust after something that you don't have. When you lust after something that you don't have, when you get it, it will become an idol in your life. It will replace what God has intended to be there himself. When you lust after something that you don't have, when you desire something that you don't have, I, I've, I've, I've had to cede to the fact that if God wants me to have it, he'll give it to me. If he does not want me to have it, he will keep it from me. When, when, when you live by that idea and, and, and live with that, it gives you sort of this peace and this calmness in your heart that, man, you know what? Maybe I don't need it. My wife's a good reminder sometimes every once in a while, Solomon, you don't need that. She may be speaking through the Lord, I don't know, but it's frustrating sometimes. But listen, when we covet after those things that we desire, we lust after them, they, they, they quickly turn to idolatry. And the Lord was very specific in giving the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no gods before me. Thou shalt not create any false images, false idols. Very important. Then he goes on to say in verse 6, For which things sake, or with those things, with fornication, uncleanness, uh, inordinate passions, uh, 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 evil desires, covetous, which is idolatry, he says, for which things sake, he says, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. If you want to live this way, if this is what you want to pursue, if this is what you want to do, the, uh, the Bible says, Paul says, that the wrath of God is going to come on the children of disobedience. I just want to unwrap this really quickly. Paul says to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 2 and chapter 3, he says, among whom also we all had our conversations in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Paul again says in verse number six that the wrath of God is going to come on the children of disobedience, the children of wrath. In John 8, 44, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and to the Sadducees. You are of your father, the devil. And you do what he wants. The children of wrath, the children of disobedience. God's wrath is going to come upon those that choose to live outside of God's will by continuously living in these lifestyles and doing these things that are addressed as sin in the Bible. Now again, I will make very clear that if you truly repent and you're grieved of your sin, and listen, we all fall short of the glory of God. 
and we all slip up and we all make mistakes. And man, I, I, I covet after things and I idolize things and I have these thoughts and I have these desires and I, you know, I want to do things and say things that are evil and wicked. But man, I'm convicted of it at the end of the day, if not immediately right away. Lord, forgive me for even thinking about that or doing that or idolizing that or coveting after that. No, Paul is speaking about those that choose to continuously live this way, that show zero regard for repentance, that have zero desire for restoration and reconciliation with the Lord, that deny the cross, that reject the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's those who the wrath of God will come down upon. It's them. But let me remind you again what Paul says, that when Christ comes again in his glory, we're going to st be standing right there with him in his. Because we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because we repented. Because we're allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us and to grow us in our faith and to challenge us in these things which we used to be. And Paul even addresses this beginning in verse 8 uh, down to verse number, verse number 10. He says, but now ye also put off. He says, put off all these, all those things that I just talked about. He says also, put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, cursing out of your mouth. He says, lie not one to another. Man, don't lie to each other. Don't be a liar. He says, seeing that ye have, again, put off the old man with his deeds, he says, and have put on, so look at, we put off these, we put off these, and then Paul says, and we have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ, after the image of Jesus Christ that created him. Paul says, you've put off all these things, you've put off all these things, he says, and now you have put on the new man. Again, if any man is in Christ Jesus, behold, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We put off the old man. We put on the new. Being created in the image of him, of God, folks. But the idea is, is that we have put them off. We are no longer... We are no longer those that commit those acts, those sins that Paul talks about. Matter of fact, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says this, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, in verse 9. He says, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. These are the children of disobedience that Paul is talking about in Colossians, that the wrath of God is going to come upon. And Paul says, and such were some of you. You used to be this. You were that old person. That's why he says twice in our text, put off. Put off those things. Die to them. He says, and such were some of you in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. He says, but now you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We are made new in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit of God. That is why it is so vital that we put those things away, that we die to them, that we bury them, that we remove them out of our life. They will do nothing but hinder our progress and our relationship with the Lord. They will hinder your growth in your faith. They will prevent you from the kingdom blessings that God has ready to give to you. 
when you choose to do these things. But again, be reminded that you have put on the new in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to say in verse 11, and I love this, he says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian or Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. In other words, we are all in Christ and he is in all of us. There is no separation of, well, well, you're Jew over here, and you're Gentile over here, and you're a slave over here, and you're free over here, and you're black over here, and you're white over here, and you're barbarian over here. And you're, it, none of that matters. Christ is in all, and we are all collectively in Christ. That's why I love when the book of Revelation says that every tribe, every tongue, and every nation is seen in the kingdom of God. That means every color of skin that you would ever imagine to be here on earth, every native tongue language that has ever been spoken, every nation, even those that haven't been found yet, is, 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 is being represented in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your past is. Know this, that what matters is your future. And your future can begin now in the present when we surrender our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and allow him to be Lord of our life. He says in verse number 12, he says, uh, put on. So check this out. So we've put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications. We've put off, all, you know, we've put off uh, uh, the old man with his deeds. We've put on the new man. And Paul in verse 12 says this, put on again. So we're taking things off and we're putting things on. It's like my girls love to do, man. They love to do fashion shows, man. If you've got girls, girls love to do fashion shows. If they got a wardrobe, they want to do fashion shows. Man, my, my, my granddaughter, Ava, uh, uh, my son and, and, and his wife, they, 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 they bought her like a little red carpet and it has like this, this curtain and, and behind it she has this little wardrobe box and, and she changes and, and it's as if it's, she, she's walking the runway. She loves to do that. She loves to come out and she's wearing her Disney princess dresses and she loves to you know walk the runway and then she'll go back behind it. She'll make a wardrobe change. She'll put off the old stuff and she'll put on the new stuff and, and, and make the, the runway walk again. It, but it's a constant changing, church family. It's a constant changing of putting off the old. Listen, we've got to work at it to put off the old. I wish it came naturally to not want to be like my old self. I wish it came, came easy to put off the old Solomon. The old desires that I had, the old lusts that I had, the old wants that I had, I wish it came easy, but it doesn't. We've got to work at putting on the new. We've got to work at putting on, as Paul says in verse 12, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, what does he tell us to put on? Bowels of mercy or tender mercies. Mercy. Unwarranted favor, man. I love that description of mercy. Unwarranted favor. It's when you deserve a butt whooping, but you don't get one. That's unwarranted favor. You, you deserved it, but, but you were shown mercy. It was withheld from you. The wrath of dad or the wrath of God. He says, put on bowels of mercy. He says, put on kindness. Be kind. There's so much hatred in this world, folks. People are mean and nasty. Even to their own family members, man, to their own siblings, to their moms or their dads, to their friends. People are just mean and nasty. Paul says, be kind, put on kindness. He says, put on humbleness of mind and be humble in all that you do. Don't be proud. Don't be boastful. Don't be puffed up or lifted up. Pride comes before a fall. 
Pride always comes before a fall. Satan was the first one of those to give us that example. He says, put on meekness. Meekness, man, strength under control. That's the best definition of meekness I can come up with, man. Strength under control. You know you got the strength to do something, but you're controlling it. Jesus Christ on that cross, he could have taken himself off. He could have called down a legion of angels in the Garden of Gethsemane. He told Peter to wipe out everybody. In all his strength, and all his power, and all his might, Christ kept it under control. Paul says to put on long-suffering, patience. Put on patience. He says forbearing one another. I love this forbearing. Listen, here's the best explanation of this I can give you. Putting up with one another. Y'all, listen, I'm raising my hand as high as I can. We all have family that we got to put up with, man. Oh, no, so-and-so's coming to town for, the, for holidays. Oh, no, so-and-so's coming over. We got to forbear. And, and, and we got to do so in love, as Paul's going to point out here in a moment. He says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. He says, if any man have a quarrel against any, forgiving if any, if, if you've got a quarrel against anybody, if you are at, if you are fighting with somebody, Paul says, forgive one another. He says, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. I, I, I want to read to you Matthew 6, verses 14 and, and 15, because Jesus put such a major emphasis on the importance of forgiveness that I must share this with you. What Jesus said uh, 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 during the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, he says in verses 14 and 15, he says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Oh, well, that's good. Okay. For, if, if I'm willing to forgive, God's going to forgive me. But I want you to hear this. He says, but if you forgive not men their trespasses, he says, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Jesus emphasized, most importantly, how much forgiveness means to our Heavenly Father. Why? Because God sacrificed his only begotten son to forgive us of our most egregious and terrible sins that we have ever committed. And folks, I want you to think outside your little bubble for a moment, not just yours. And you can say to yourself, well, I haven't done anything too bad. Okay. I haven't, I haven't murdered and I haven't raped, and I haven't blas blasphemed, and I haven't done this, that, or the I mean, just think of the most egregious sin that someone could commit. Those people that are on death row today, what did they do? I want you to know right now that Christ died on the cross for them too. Christ died for them to forgive them of their sins. That is why it is so important as not only Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount, but as Paul says, to forgive one another. Folks, I need the forgiveness of God. And I need it so much that this should be my attitude towards forgiveness. I'm willing to forgive anybody anything. I, I, I pray and I hope that if there was an absolute unforgivable sin committed against me or one of my family members. One of those sins that, that you would hear a lot of people say, I'll never forgive you for what you did. I pray that I have the heart to say, I forgive you. You need Jesus. 
forgiveness is so vitally important in shaping and molding who we are in Christ Jesus. And furthermore, being accepted into the kingdom of God because of Christ forgiving us for all that we have done. Paul says in verse 14, and he says, and above all these things, he says, put on charity or put on love. Above everything, he says, put on love. And so listen, we're, we're, we're putting on mercy. We're putting on kindness. We're putting on humbleness. We're putting on meekness. We're putting on patience. He Earlier on, we're putting on the new man. But he says, above all these things, he says, put on love. The very first thing that we ought to put on, folks, is love. Because when we put on love, when we clothe ourselves in love, when we tie up our bootstraps and our shoes with love, let me tell you something. What happens? All those other things that Paul is talking about to put on, they come so much easier to do. When I put on love first, it's easier for me to be merciful. When I put on love first, it's easier for me to be kind. It's easier for me to be humble. It's easier for me to be meek and to be patient. It's easier for me to live as the new man because I've put on love first, which Paul goes on to say, which is the bond of perfectness. God's love is perfect. There is nothing lacking in God's love. There's nothing missing in God's love. There's nothing that needs to be added to God's love. And so when we put that love on first, we are made complete and we are made perfect and we can go forward and put on all these other things that the Bible says we ought to be putting on. That's the desire of God for you and I in our lives. He goes on to say in verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. The peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body. He says, and be ye thankful. I want to bring you to John chapter 14 real quickly because I want to sort of expand on the peace of God. John chapter 14 says this in verse 27. He says, Peace, this is Jesus speaking. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. He says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And so what does it mean when Paul says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts? It's the peace of God that only can be given in and through Christ Jesus. It is a peace that this world cannot give. And I'll tell you why. The world does not have the authority and the power that God Almighty has to give his peace the way that he can give it. The world does not belong to God. The world is not of God. The things of the world don't represent God. And so God is not going to give his peace to the world. He is going to give his peace that surpasses all understanding to those that have placed their faith in his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Oh, and by the way, it is a peace that causes you and I to let our hearts not be troubled, nor let it be afraid. And so when Paul says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, we can allow that peace to rule in our hearts, not having a worry in the world when it comes to our, our spiritual walks with the Lord, when it comes to eternity, because we have that security in us that this is a peace that no one else can have but those that are found in Christ Jesus. It is a peace that the world cannot give. And it is a peace that keeps us from fear and keeps us from being dismayed. He says, let that rule in your hearts. I've heard somebody say, and I say this very cautiously, that doubt and fear is a sin. And I, and, and I don't want to elaborate or expand on that, 
But I will put this to you this morning. When you have doubt, right, you're certainly potentially questioning what God is doing in your life. When you have fear, you're not trusting in the Lord with all your heart. As Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, you're, you're, you're leaning on your own understanding. When, when King Solomon writes, lean not on your own understanding. When we allow the peace of God to rule in our hearts, there is a comfort that comes upon us that is irreplaceable by anything that we could ever find in this world. He says, to the which also you are called in one body. He says, and be ye thankful. The end of verse 15. Be thankful. Have an attitude of gratitude. Lord, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for how you've blessed. Thank you for how you've led. Thank you for your provision, for your protection, for your peace. Lord, thank you for it all. An attitude of gratitude, church family. Then he says in verse 16, let the word of Christ, let God's word, the word of Christ dwell in you richly, it says in all wisdom. We're going through the book of Proverbs on Thursday nights. It's a book of wisdom. We're, we're going through it because I, I want the word of Christ to dwell in us, to dwell in me, to dwell in you richly in all wisdom. James chapter 1 says, if you lack wisdom, ask of God who will give it to you. You should desire to have God's word hidden in your heart. You should desire to have God's word dwell in your heart, to dwell in you richly. He goes on to say in verse 16, in teaching and admonishing one another. He says in Psalms, there's a whole book of 150 chapters dedicated to Psalms. And hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That is the desire of the Lord for you and I. That his word dwell in us richly in all wisdom. And that with one another, we use God's word to teach. We use God's word to admonish to encourage, to edify, that we use God's word to, to sing those psalms and, and those hymns and those spiritual songs. He says, singing with grace in your hearts unto the Lord. Again, that attitude of gratitude, Lord, thank you. I am lifting up my voice in praise. I am lifting up my voice in worship, in adoration, in reverence of who you are, of what you've done for me. And you do that collectively with one another. You share that experience. Folks, the Bible is so created that it, when it's shared with others, it's an experience that you can't find anywhere else. Yes, you, 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 want, your, you want your alone time. You want your private time. You want your time of meditating on God's word. Man, I, 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 feel, I feel empty when I don't get it in the morning. But man, this word was meant to be shared with each other. This word was meant to be used to teach one another and to encourage one another and to admonish one another. I'm telling you, this word gets so much better, man, when it's shared with each other. I can't tell you how many times I, I, I've read something and man, I got to share it with somebody. I got to get it out there. And then in verse 17, Paul says this, and whatsoever ye do, whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, he says, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Whatever you do, do it in, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you say, say it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In our actions, in our words, in our thoughts, 
We want to make sure that we are representing the Lord Jesus Christ. The last thing I want to do is in my deeds, boy, that's not very Christ-like. In my words, that's not very Christ-like. No, Paul says, in whatsoever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Honor God in everything that you do. Seek to please God in everything that you say. And then in verse 18, verse 19, verse 20 and 21, he begins to speak to particular positions. He says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit or fitting to the Lord. We went through this in Ephesians chapter 5. That word submit is not this, oh, okay, you know, he's my master and I've got to obey him and bow down to him and make him a sandwich whenever he says I want a sandwich. No, it's to have respect or reverence for your husband. I remember preaching through Ephesians 5. I'll say it again as I said it then. I want my wife to respect me more than I want her to love me. How I want to receive love from my wife is through how she respects me, how she reveres me. That's how I receive love from my wife. My love receives, my wife receives love from me differently. Right? There's some other things that I need to do. My wife doesn't care so much about being respected or revered. She wants me to show her I love her. She wants me, she wants me to treat her like I love her. Do the little things. I'm telling you, husbands, when you friggin' fold some laundry, whew, holy smokes, I can't tell you, my wife coming home on a date, she's worked hard, and I'm off, and I folded the laundry. Good night. Husbands, you're not off the hook, though. He says in verse 19, Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter. Don't brush them off. Don't treat them harshly. What does Ephesians 5.23 says? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself a sacrifice for it. Sacrificial love is how the Bible says husbands ought to love their wives. Children, children, obey your parents in all things. In what? Jake just asked me. In all things, children. Obey your parents in all things. He says, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. I would tell any child right now sitting before me that is still under the, 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 the rulership, if you will, of mom and dad's house. Don't obey your parents just because the Bible says to obey your parents. Obey your parents in all things because it is well-pleasing to the Lord. Seek to please the Lord through your obedience to mom and dad, and that is how you ought to live your life as a child. That is what you ought to do. I would never tell my child, you know, be disobedient. But I would tell my child first, seek to please the Lord. And in doing so, you will find that with that comes the need to be obedient to mom and dad in all things. Not some things, not a few things, not those things or that thing. The Bible says in all things, be obedient. Because it is well-pleasing to the Lord. Finally, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Fathers can be harsh. I had a harsh father. My father had a harsh father. My father's father had a harsh father. The Bible says, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. It is the parent's job to encourage their children, to lift up their children. 
Sometimes you got to lay the hammer down. It's biblical. Withhold not the rod, spare not the rod. But it is a parent's job to lift up their children, to encourage them, to train them up in the way that they should go so that when they are older, it will not depart from them. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. He says, servants, let me, let me identify servants in this context for you. Anybody that has a boss, anybody that's an employer that reports to somebody. Now, if you're lucky enough to be the president, the CEO, or even be retired, your boss is the Lord Jesus Christ, or maybe it's your wife. I have no idea. But he says, servants, for context, employees, think about it this way, employees, Obey in all things your masters, your bosses, your leaders, your managers, according to the flesh, right? In, 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 your, in your professions, in your jobs. He says, not with eye service, as men pleasers. He says, but in singleness of heart or in sincerity of heart, Fearing God. When we go to work, maybe it is your goal. You want to get promoted. You want to move your way up into the company. I remember those days of, of, of mine in hospitality. I wanted to move up. I wanted to grow. But I wanted to do so in singleness of heart or in sincerity of heart Fearing God, saying, Lord, if this is your will, not mine, make this happen. I didn't want to go out there and be a man pleaser or be a, a yes man. I didn't want to give eye service to anybody. It's not built up in me to give eye service to anybody, to be a yes man. You know, to honor people with my lips, but my heart could just care less. When you do it under the Lord... As Paul even said in verse 17, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God will honor that and bless that. He says again in verse number 23, and whatsoever you do, he says, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. There again, whatsoever you do, do it heartily. Do it with all your heart, all your might. Do it with everything you have. Give your all to that job. Give your all to that marriage. Give your all to your kids. Give your all to your church. Give your all to your friendships. He says, but do it as to the Lord. Do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and not unto man. Lord, I want to honor you in all that I do. I want to honor you in this job. I'm going to give it my all. Lord, I want to honor you in my marriage. I'm going to give it my all. Lord, I'm going to honor you with my kids. I'm going to give it my all. Lord, I'm going to honor you with this, that, or the other. I'm going to give it my all because I want to honor God. And the great thing about God is that when we honor him above all, we tend to be honored by those that we are trying to honor through our relationship with the Lord. That's just how God works. When we prioritize honoring him first, man, he's going to set us up in positions we had no idea we'd ever find ourselves in. Folks, let me share with you a story, man. In 2015, when I was working in hospitality, I was director of security at, at, the, uh, at the hotel there in Rancho Mirage. I was, I'm telling you, this close from either getting fired or quitting. I couldn't stand my boss. I couldn't stand my general manager. They were, ter they were just rotten people. I didn't want to work for them. And then I, had a, I just had a change come over me, and I know it was my, my walk with the Lord. I know it was my walk with the Lord. I changed, seeking to honor God. And guess what? 
In that year, my boss left. In that year, the GM left. I was this close from getting fired or quitting. And the very next year in 2016, and I say this because God honored me, because I began to honor God in my job, I won manager of the year at the hotel. I went from almost getting fired because my GM and my boss didn't like me to the very next year winning manager of the year. Because I changed my perspective. I changed who I was honoring. It's so important. He goes on to say with this thought in verse 24, he says, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Right, folks, we're inheriting the kingdom of God. For ye serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, honor God whatsoever you do. Do it heartily as to the Lord. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because you know that of the Lord, you are going to receive the inheritance, the kingdom of God. That is what we ought to be working towards. We ought to be working towards receiving that inheritance. I want to be ready to receive it. I don't want to have anything holding me back that I have done to myself or that I have done that is not honoring or pleasing to God. I want to be ready for the inheritance when that day comes because I have worked my whole life to please the Lord Jesus Christ in everything that I have set myself forth to do in word or in deed. He says in verse 25, though, and we're going to close, but he that doeth wrong. Go back to what those things Paul said we should be putting off. He says, he that doeth wrong, he says, shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Paul says, if you have done wrong, you shall receive for the wrong that you have done. Those are those that refuse to put off those things that Paul says to put off. I, I go back to 2 Corinthians a chapter 2, verse 14. We talked about this a, a couple of weeks ago. The handwriting of ordinances. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, I spoke about the handwriting of ordinances. I spoke about the books at the great white throne of judgment that are going to be opened up and men will be judged according to their works. They will receive from God what is justly due them for the works that they have done. Thankfully for you and I and for those that have placed their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, my book's written, my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, which is where I want my name written. All of those deeds that have, were written in, in, in the handwriting of ordinances have been blotted out, remember Paul says. They've been erased. Once something's erased, folks, it's gone. You erase a, a memory card, it's gone. You can't get that stuff back. The handwriting of ordinances against us has been erased. But Paul says in verse 25 here of our text in, in chapter 3, he says, he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. A position, folks, no one wants to find themselves in. Yet multitudes are and will continue to be found in because of their rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul finishes out and says, and there is no respect of persons. Why does Paul write that at the end? It doesn't matter if you are a king, a prince, a princess, a queen, a president, a, a CEO, a, 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 a prime minister. It doesn't matter if you are the lowly beggar on the street. All will receive for the wrong which they have done. It doesn't matter what position you've held here on earth. That does not matter to God. That's why the Bible says God is no respecter of persons. When it comes to God's justice, 
When it comes to God's judgment, there is no respecter of persons. Oh, well, you know, you were this, that, or the other on earth. I guess I can go ahead and let a few of these things go by. No, not at all. Your position here on earth matters very little, if not at all, to the Lord. What matters is your position in the kingdom of God in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. That is where God wants us. That is where we need to be. And that is where I pray we find ourselves. If not right now, before it's too late, our position in Jesus Christ. Amen, church family? Well, pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I just thank you so much for your word, Lord. I thank you for the teaching of your word. I thank you, Father, for the goodness and for the truth of your word, Lord. And Father, I pray that uh, this word that has been spoken this morning out of Colossians chapter 3, Lord, I pray that it has been used for the encouragement, for the edification of the saints. Lord, I pray that it will continue to be used to those that are going to watch later, to those that are going to hear this message later, Lord God. I pray that it encourages them that it edifies them, Lord, that it admonishes them, and that, Lord, no matter what, that their position in Christ Jesus will be secure and will be solid, Father God. I thank you so much, Father God, for this church family. May you continue to encourage them and minister to them, to them, bless them, Lord God, and strengthen them as we go forth. I ask and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.